Good evening to everybody. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming tonight. And uh, we started, uh, several of our adults are over in the other building. We started our children's program back tonight. And so pray for that service that they'll have a good time. But we appreciate you being here tonight. If you're visiting with us at Newtown, we're glad to have you. God bless you. And I pray you'll come again. Please, Newtown folks, remember all the announcements. Be right in your place. Remember the families that have had death, the Walraven family. They're receiving friends at uh, Brandon's funeral home uh, tomorrow, and uh, we ask you to pray for them. Uh, we ask you to pray for the Duvall family They'll be having visitation here on Tuesday from 4 until 8. The funeral service will be at 12 on Wednesday. So pray for these families. We've had so many deaths. I thought this morning, this first week, we haven't had a death listed in our bulletin, but there will be next week. So please pray for these families. We ask you to pray for Jean Huffstadler. They had to take him to the hospital today. Uh, pray for all the others who are sick or just getting over surgeries and so on. Pray that God will be with them. We're here tonight to worship and hear the word of God. Let's stand together. We're going to have a word of prayer. And then we'll turn it over to the stars of our program. And they're going to sing and give praise to the Lord. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for your goodness, for your blessings. Thank you for this day. I pray you'll bless the children's program that's starting tonight over in the other building. Bless all of our workers who are over there. Pray that you'll be with each of them. I pray for this service tonight. I pray that your name will be glorified and magnified. Lord, I pray tonight for those families who had loss of loved ones. I pray for those who are so sick. God, those in the hospital, would you be with them and lift them up. Now, Father, I pray you'll bless our singers tonight, our speaker. I pray the Holy Spirit will just take charge of this service. In Christ's name I pray. And everybody said... All right, we're here to worship. Let's worship God. All righty, I'm going to open us up with a little bit of scripture. I'm going to read from Psalm 25, 1 through 5. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who you wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Stand with us and sing. Savior say, I 
my strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus, bring it all. No, to him I owe. Sin I love to crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Eclipsed by 
glory when I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me how you love how you love us oh how you love us oh how you love us oh how you love and we are his portion and he is our bride strong to redemption by the grace in his eyes if his grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven meets us like an upper sea kissing my heart turns violently inside of my chest and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when Think about the way He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane, and I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. search the world, but you couldn't feel me, and that's empty praise and treasures to fade are never enough. satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, I know God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Lord, there's nothing 
better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. And you turn moans into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Cause there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Cause there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Our guest speaker tonight is Porter Johnson. Porter is a senior Christian studies major at Shorter University. After graduating in December, he plans to attend New Orleans Baptist Theo Theological Seminary to work on a master's in divinity. Please welcome Porter Johnson. Of my, my brother's age, and after daughter, who is my sister's age, um, all of our parents get along really well. So we've been going on vacation with them for as long as I can remember. We've been really close to this family for as long as I can remember. And Sam, uh, the name of their son, so he and I have been really close for a long time. But our friendship has been through a couple rough patches. Right, there were a couple times where we got in some arguments. Uh, two specifically stick out to me. One, uh, I think we were probably about ten years old. And we got into a very heated argument over how to play jacks, right? You know, the game with the little stuff and the bouncy ball. We got into a very heated argument about that. Didn't talk to each other for like two days while we were on vacation, even though we are sharing a room. Um, another story that sticks out to me is one, uh, we, it was slightly more physical uh, than the previous one. So we got in some kind of argument or disagreement. I don't remember exactly what it was over. I think it was something to do with a girl or something like that. Uh, but we started to get into it. He pushed me one time real hard, and so I got really upset, and I like, grabbed him and started to pick him up. Um, and then he like did something crazy. I don't know what happened, but somehow he like flipped over me and landed on his feet. And in that moment, both of us kind of stopped and stared at each other. And then we were like, 
That was awesome! Like, dude, that was so cool. So, like, everything that we were just about to fight about uh, just became like, okay, that's not really worth it anymore, because that was super cool. Um, but teenage boys will fight over just about anything. Um, but most of the time, the stuff they're fighting over is not worth fighting for. So my question that I want to pose as we begin this message is, what is worth fighting for? What is worth fighting for? And the book of Jude is going to provide an answer for us. In verses 3 and 4, it says, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you, to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. Pray with me. God, I am thankful for the opportunity to preach your word tonight. I thank you that you've redeemed someone like me and that you've used me for your glory. God, never let me forget what you brought me out of, that I was dead in my sin, that you have brought me to life. God, I come before you asking for your Holy Spirit to work through the words that I say. I have no power of my own. And if I want to see anything happen, I must rely on you. So I do so right now. Please help me to simply expose the meaning of your word and apply it to these people. Please encourage this congregation to contend for the faith. I pray that you would meet their needs, both physical and spiritual, according to your grace and according to your will. And I pray that we would all know you better as a result of our time here tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the book of Jude uh, is a letter written by a guy named Jude. And so Jude was the brother of Jesus, and he's also the brother of James. But at the beginning of this book, he claims to be Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So he is Jesus' brother, but he identifies himself as a servant of Jesus. That is how all of us ought to identify ourselves, as servants of Christ. But this letter that he's writing is addressed to a group of everyday Christians, right? This letter is not addressed to biblical scholars. It's not addressed to pastors. It is addressed to Christians. And that's significant because Jude writes this letter assuming that his audience has a very good understanding of the scriptures, has a very good foundation of knowledge of the Bible. He expects them to know the scriptures and the gospel very well. And this is evident through the numerous illustrations he uses, and also through the fact that he calls them to stand on the truth. Because in order to stand on the truth, you must know the truth. He encourages them to, um, to stand against some false teaching. Right? And in order to stand against false teaching, you have to know what true teaching is. You can never identify a curved line if you don't know what a straight line looks like. So there's an assumption from the beginning of this book that the audience knows the scriptures. And he is simply writing this to Christians. So the assumption there and the application of this is know your Bible. Know what it says. Learn it. Study it. And obey it. But Jude calls his audience to stand against something. All right, he says that his desire was to write a lighthearted and encouraging letter to this group of people. But then he goes on to say that he, he, he had to, it was necessary for him to write this more serious letter, this letter of exhortation. Exhortation simply meaning a, a strong urge and a plea with a group of people to take action and do something. He found it necessary to tell these people to against a group of people who were teaching a false gospel and living ungodly lives. Now this means that there is a right way to understand the gospel and there is a wrong way to understand the gospel. There is a right way to understand the Bible, and there is a wrong way to understand the Bible. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul writes, Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. 
Paul's writing this to Timothy, who is his spiritual son, someone that he's been mentoring and teaching. And he writes to him saying, make sure that you are teaching the Bible correctly. Make sure that you are teaching these people correctly. So the existence of something that is correct, a correct way to understand the Bible, is evidence that there is also incorrect ways to understand the Bible and to understand the gospel. And in verse 4, Jude lays out an example of misunderstanding the gospel. Right? He says that these people, they have come in by stealth, they are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ as master and Lord. So he's saying to use the gospel as an excuse to sin is to corrupt it. Jude focuses on the actions of these ungodly people. They have taken the grace of God, which is a good thing, and they have perverted it into an excuse or a license to sin. So our first point tonight is this. Contend for the faith because the ungodly corrupt it. Contend for the faith because the ungodly corrupt it. Using the idea of God's grace as a license to sin is simply not acceptable. Like these people, they, they think they're James Bond, right? He had a license to kill. They think they have a license to sin. But those don't exist. Like, yes, God is gracious. But that does not mean you can do whatever you want and still go to heaven. Once you're saved, Jesus is Lord of your life. That means he's the one with the authority. That means he's the one that decides what is wrong and what is right. So how do we know what he says about morality? How do we know what Jesus says is wrong? How do we know what Jesus says is right? We take a look at this beautiful 66-volume book that he has given us. Read it, study it, and obey it. Christianity is a lifetime of pursuing righteousness while at the same time trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's a lifetime of pursuing right living while at the same time having the understanding that you're never going to be perfect, but there is something perfect for you to trust in. To trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ rather than your own. But to not let Jesus define your understanding of right and wrong is to deny him as the Lord of your life. And that's what these people were doing that Jude is talking about. That's what this teaching that he's addressing is saying, look, if Jesus is not the one who determines your thinking and your understanding of what's right and what's wrong, then you are not honoring him as Lord of your life. In verses 12 and 13, we're gonna jump down just a little bit. It says, these people are dangerous reefs at your love feasts as they eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. So Jude, in this passage, in these couple of verses, uses some, he uses some imagery to, de- to describe the corrupted teachers, the people who have been using the gospel as an excuse to sin, this is how he describes them. He describes them as reefs. So think of reefs in a body of water. They hide just below the surface, right? These hard objects ready to destroy things that are floating across the top. Think of a ship. If you don't avoid reefs while you're driving a ship, your ship's going to be destroyed. And then we apply this to the Christian life in this passage. If you do not avoid false teachers, your faith will be corrupted and it will ultimately be destroyed. So stay on guard. Contend for the faith. He next describes them as selfish shepherds. What is a shepherd supposed to do? He's supposed to take care of his flock. And this is reference to Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 2. It says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? Shepherds ought to take care of their flocks. False teachers have no true regard for others. They only tell people what they want to hear in order to to pursue personal gain. 
They just tell people what they want to hear so that they can benefit from it. And that's not truly caring for a group of people. Truly caring for a group of people is telling them the truth in love. The next piece of imagery he uses is waterless clouds. This is a, refer- a reference to Proverbs twenty five fourteen that says, The one who boasts about a gift that does not exist is like clouds and wind without rain. Someone who is boasting about a gift that does not exist is full of pride. These false teachers were full of pride. They will not submit their desires to Jesus because they're too busy trusting in themselves. As a result of that, he describes them as waterless clouds. And fruitless trees comes next. In Matthew 7, verses 15 through 17, he says, Be on guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize, recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. If they are fruitless trees, they are not producing anything good, so we can identify them as bad. If someone claims to be of God, their life ought to reflect that. They ought to be obedient to the scriptures. They ought to mimic the character of Jesus Christ. And next he describes them as wild waves. This is a reference to Isaiah 57, 20. It says, but the wicked are like the storm-tossed sea, for it cannot be still, and its water churns up mire and muck. These false teachers, these ungodly people, are simply wicked. And wandering stars, for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. This means that judgment is, abides on the ungodly. That God does not approve of their actions. God does not approve of their hearts. So, the blackness of darkness is what awaits them. And this is imagery for hell. So contend for the faith. Because if you don't, these type of people are the ones that you're following. If you do not contend for faith, if you do not contend for the scriptures, if you don't stand on what the Bible says and the truth that is found here, then these are the types of people you're following. And your destination will be the same as theirs if you do not contend for the faith. So our second point, contend for the faith because judgment abides on the ungodly. Contend for the faith because judgment abides on the ungodly. We continue reading verses 14 through 16. It was about these that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, Look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things the ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are discontented grumblers, living according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. And Jude continues to explain this concept of judgment abiding on the ungodly. The warning quoted here is from the book of Enoch. right? And so, um, no, this book is not in the Bible, but Jude expected his audience to be familiar with it because um, this book... Enoch was in the Christian tradition, so it's not a part of the Bible, it's not a part of the scriptures, but among the Jewish community, it was respected. So he expected them to be familiar with it. And this passage that Jude quotes from Enoch, that passage of Enoch is actually quoting three different passages in the Bible. It's quoting a passage from Deuteronomy, a passage from Zechariah, and a passage from Isaiah. And the point of Jude including this warning is this. God has declared judgment on the ungodly long ago. And Jude 4, verse 4 of the book of Jude supports this when it describes those who have perverted God's grace as people whose condemnation was written about long ago. He's saying, look, it's not a new thing that these people are distorting the gospel message. It's a thing that's been happening. But here's the thing. Judgment has been on them from long ago. And in verses 17 through 19, it says, But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you, 
In the end time, there will be scoffers living according to their own, to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the Spirit. And then here, Jude includes a more recent warning about false teachers from the apostles, from these people who have, who have just been alive or still are alive at the time Jude is writing this letter. The apostles warned the church about false teaching repeatedly, basing their warnings on one from Jesus, that of Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 19. Be on guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are graves gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And Jude 18 defines these false teachers as scoffers who live according to their own ungodly desires. That is the bad fruit that this passage in Matthew is talking about. Living according to your own ungodly desires. So if someone is living according to their own desires, they're not of God. If someone is not denying the desires of their flesh, they're not of God. If someone does not resist the temptations to sin that they experience, they're not of God. Be careful to examine yourself and those you listen to by these standards. This does not mean that people don't make mistakes. This does not mean that people don't, um, that people don't stumble at times. But it does mean that mistakes aren't just brushed aside. They're not just brushed aside and justified. Rather, they are brought to Jesus and they're forgiven by him. They're repented of. So we've heard why we need to contend for the faith. Now, the next logical question that we ought to ask, how do we contend for the faith? Well, luckily, Jude continues uh, writing, and he tells us, But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Every good building has a solid foundation. The foundation is laid out at the very beginning of verse 20. The foundation of contending for the flesh when he says, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, Building yourselves up in your most holy faith is the foundation to contending for the gospel. So our third point, contend for the faith by believing the gospel. Build up your understanding of the scriptures. Build up your understanding of God's word. It's the most valuable thing you can read. It's the most valuable thing you can study. Build up your understanding of it. And then building off the foundation, building off the foundation of knowledge of the scriptures involves a few things. So first, praying in the Holy Spirit. Charles Spurgeon once said, a prayerless soul is a Christless soul. How could you ever expect your faith in God to grow if you do not communicate with him? Think of the closest human relationships that you have. If you're married, it's very likely with your spouse. If you're not married, it's likely with your best friend or maybe a mentor or a sibling or even a parent. Why is that relationship so deep? It is deep because there is communication on a consistent basis that also is deep. There's a depth of communication that takes place consistently, and that is what drives a relationship to really mean something. And that's what your relationship with God must have. You must pray. Second, keeping in the love of God. You keep yourself in the love of God by obedience. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
Obedience to God is evidence that you love him. That is the proof of your love for God. That if you obey what he says. Now you do not obey God in order to earn his love. But rather you obey God because you understand his love. You understand that the rules that he has put in place. You understand that the, the decrees that he has spoken are for your good. And because he loves you. And because he desires what is best for you. And that is ultimately satisfaction in him. So obeying God's word is crucial. Is crucial to abiding in his love. Build up your faith by being obedient to God. And then third, by waiting expectantly for the salvation of Jesus Christ. Wait expectantly for eternity in heaven Look forward to it. The hope of Christianity is that the suffering we endure on this earth is the closest thing to hell we will ever experience. The hope of Christianity is that there is a glory that is coming that totally eclipses every bit of suffering that we have endured. We have a glorious reward ahead of us, so we must look forward to it. The 4th of July wasn't too long ago. Um, on that day, nearly every American will sit in a lawn chair on a sidewalk in a tailgate, and they will stare at the sky, looking up, expecting to see something incredible. Looking up, expecting to see fire in the sky. That's pretty awesome. Like, just stuff exploding in the air. That's pretty sweet. We're all Americans in here, you know, we can say that. That's stuff exploding in the sky. Awesome. But why, why do people look up with such anticipation on the 4th of July? Why do they look up? Because they know they're about to see something glorious. Fireworks are incredible. They capture our attention. We wait eagerly for them. Now imagine how much more the Christian should wait eagerly for the salvation of Jesus Christ. For his mercy poured out on us. We get to spend eternity worshiping him. That's far more glorious than any firework. So we ought to wait expectantly for that. And then fourth, by showing mercy to those who waver. Apparently there are some people who are persuaded of the ungodly teaching that Jude was refuting. So he instructed his audience to show mercy to those who have wavered, but he urged them to do so carefully. He says, show mercy on them in a corrective manner thus saving them from the fire. So correct people. And yes, at times this does mean confrontation. At times this does mean taking a stand on what is really true, despite someone that you love disagreeing with you. But he says, look, do this in a way that is loving. Do this not so that you can be right, but do this so that they can be saved from the fire. Stand on the truth out of care for others, not out of pride in yourself. This also, show them mercy in a cautious manner, thus keeping yourselves from falling into the same sins as them. That's why he says, have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So have mercy on these people, but be careful. Do not fall into sin as you are doing that. As you meet people where they are, remain pure yourself, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Hate the garment, but love the person. Believing in the gospel is what leads to all of these practices. Believing in Jesus Christ, believing that he died for you, believing that he rose from the grave, repenting of your sin, And trusting in his righteousness over yours is what is going to lead you to all of these actions. This is what is going to lead you to contend for the faith. That's why he begins that passage saying, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. And then all of these things come. Verses 24 and 25, as I begin to close, I believe the band um, is going to come back up so y'all can go ahead and start making your way, but... Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. These final verses give us some insight as to why the gospel is worth fighting for. Why is this worth fighting for? Because God alone can keep you from stumbling. If you're anything like me, you stumble pretty often. And it tends to be when you rely on yourself. But God is the one who preserves his people. He is the one who both provides and perfects faith, as Hebrews chapter 12 tells us. Because God alone can make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. Now this is the driving force. This is the driving force of the gospel. This is the primary reason for us to contend for the faith. Because God alone can make you stand without blemish and can make you stand with great joy. Because we know that there is no other way for people to get to heaven. We know that there is no other way for people to be redeemed than by Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. So we contend for the faith because we know that that is the truth. If we know that people cannot get to the Father through any means other than the ones Jesus has set in place, we must contend for them. We must stand on that truth. It would be unloving for us to allow people to trust in something that we know is false. It would be unloving for us to allow people to trust something other than the gospel. So contend for the faith. And keep in mind at the same time that all of this applies to you. That only God can make you pure. Only God can save you from your sin. The only way you will get into heaven is if you trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You're not good enough to get there on your own, but you must cry out to God. Plead the righteousness of Jesus and submit your life to him. Is Jesus your savior? Or are you still trying to justify yourself before God? Are you still trying to say, God, look at all this good stuff that I've done. Look at all these, these good works that I've done that, that they might outweigh all the bad stuff that I've done. Are you still at that point? Or are you trusting in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ? Have you bestowed upon God all the glory, all the majesty, all the power, and all the authority in your life? If not, do so tonight. I urge you, as we enter this time of invitation in just a moment, repent of your sin and believe in the gospel. For this is the only way to the Father, through Jesus Christ. And if you have, if you have bestowed upon him all the glory, all the majesty, all the power, and all the authority in your life, if you are entirely submitted to God, contend for the faith. Devote your life to standing on the truth. Devote your life to sharing the gospel. Devote your life to serving the Lord. Now as we go and enter this time of invitation, I urge you to respond to this message that you've heard. Respond in whatever way the Lord leads you. He can meet you right there in your seat if need be. But respond to this message tonight, right now. Respond to it tomorrow. Respond to it every single day of your life. Respond to the gospel message with repentance and belief. Give everything over to Jesus. Pray with me. Dear God, we are thankful for your word. Dear God, we are thankful for Jesus Christ. We're thankful for something better than ourselves that we can trust in. We're thankful that we have a way to get to you. And Father, we, I, I plead with you right now that everyone who is in this room, God, that they would respond to this message in whatever way they need to. 
God, that the gospel is not just for those who haven't heard it before, but the gospel is also for Christians to respond to with greater devotion to you and greater love for you. So I pray that everyone who is in here tonight would respond to this message. God, I pray that you would be glorified through us. I pray that if there is anyone in here who doesn't know you, Lord, that you would meet them right where they are tonight. And God, that they would bestow upon you all glory, all majesty, all power, and all authority in their life. They would trust you to save them. They would admit their sin and their failure before you and trust in the righteousness that you provide so that they can know you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The invitation is open to anyone that feels a need in your heart to come, whatever it is. If you need Jesus, Somebody's here to take the Word of God and show you how to be saved. If you just have a need in your life, bring it to the Lord as the singers sing. Ask yourself the question, have I obeyed God tonight? What a message, what a challenge to our hearts. Contend for the faith. Stay in there. It's no time to give up. It's no time to quit. Examine your heart. When they get down to the chorus, let's all join in and sing. Go ahead and sing.
much people said. Amen. Do you thank God for the message tonight? Amen. Thank God for the Word. You can't improve on the Word. You can get up and tell fairy tales. You can get up and tell stories, make jokes. But thank God for preachers who preach the Word. Thank you for preaching the Word. I, as he stood there and preached, how old are you? 21. I reminded me back of my early days. I began pastoring at 18. A little country church, high attendance at 25. But uh, I thought about these preacher boys that have come and preached for us. And I'm glad somebody gave me an opportunity. I'm glad somebody cared enough to invite me to come and preach my first revival. I was 14 years old, and I'm glad that preacher, he's already with the Lord, but I'm glad he gave me an opportunity. And I'm glad these fellows could come, and I want you to put them on your prayer list. I want you to pray for them, that God will lead them and direct them. And I believe he is. They preach the word of God, every one of them. And we just thank the Lord. Thank you so much for being here tonight. There's an offering plate at every exit. Whatever you give tonight goes to our speakers, to our singers, and you do what the Lord tells you to do. I love you tonight. Church, I love you. Pray for the people this week. We've got a lot of things coming up. Pray for these two funerals. Pray that God would direct me in conducting the funeral, and, that I, and for the singers and for everybody that participates. Pray for these precious families. Pray for the Duval family. Brother uh, Duval was a deacon here. He's been gone now, what, three years? And uh, one of the finest men that I ever knew in my life. And now his dear wife. But you know, God gave her an extension on life. The doctors told her she probably wouldn't live to be 50, but she lived to be 59. Pray for this family. Pray for the Walraven family. Pray that God would be with each one of them. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the word of God that's been expounded to our hearts. Thank you, God, for preachers who do not deviate from the word of God but preach it line for line, precept upon precept, word upon word. God, we thank you for the written word of God. And I pray that we, each one of us here tonight, will contend for the faith, that we'll stay in there, come what may. God, in a day when people are denying, when people are trying to bring in some other false doctrine, Help us to stand for the faith in Jesus' name. God, I pray you'll bless these families that have had death. God, I pray you'll bless the offering tonight. Bless each one that gives and those that don't have to give. May your will be done and your name be praised. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Shake hands.